Okay, this is Dr. Tim Cote again. Uh, some technical difficulties there, but we are trying to go on to chapter 13 uh, and 14. This is the 10th lecture in the series, and we're talking about inspections and uh, FDA enforcement. Uh, inspections are very scary business. Nothing can frighten a company like uh, an inspection, not even a stock crash, not an a loss of funding, not a strike, uh, because if you have an inspection uh, in, a, in a public health crisis, it could mean that your product is uh, about to, the regulators are about to stop you having a product. So it doesn't matter what the science says, doesn't matter what the, um, what the business model is or how well business seems to be going. If you don't have your regulatory act together and an inspection comes out really badly, um, this is a death knell for your business in the pharmaceutical industry as well. It should be. So inspections are scary for uh, people working in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the focus is on of this talk is on facilities that manufacture, process, pack, hold FDA regulated products including uh, drugs, biologics, uh, medical devices, and cosmetics. And um, <clears throat> the legal purpose of those inspections is to determine whether or not uh, adulteration or misbranding has occurred. Uh, those are the two key features uh, of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that we've already talked about. Uh, inspections also occur, however, under this concept of uh, bio-research monitoring, or BIMO, um, that determines whether uh, the facility and sponsor is being compliant with uh, the IND, the Investigational New Drug and the IDE, Investigational Drug Exemption uh, Regulation, Device Exemption Regulations, excuse me, not drug. Um, FDA can also inspect uh, the IRBs and it can also inspect laboratories. So um, you should know the, the range of the kinds of things that an FDA inspection could include. Um, FDA inspections can lead to legal action uh, to correct or punish the uh, offending um, industry for infractions such as adulteration or, um, or misbranding, mislabeling. Uh, FDA uh, often issues a warning letter, but it doesn't have to. It's not required to issue a learning warning letter before you get um, hit with something. So it can initiate judicial action or any other action that it wants to uh, in advance. And um, it can issue, initiate seizures, criminal prosecutions, civil monetary penalties, uh, restraining orders, injunctions um, to prevent the distribution of uh, violative, uh, pro violative products. So a violative product is a product that violates, okay? Uh, violative is the adjectival form, form of the word. Section 704 covers inspections and the focus there is on a current good manufacturing practice or CGMP. Uh, the CGMP regs for uh, drugs and for biologics and devices have the force of law. Food GMPs are uh, just a guidance, though. They're, they don't have the force of law. And there are no cosmetic uh, GMPs. As we already mentioned, um, GMPs for, um, for devices take the form of what's called a QSR, okay? Uh, and we'll come back to that again shortly. Uh, the authority for inspections comes from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Chapter, uh, uh, chapter um, 7, V11, uh, gives the General Inspection Authority. But in 1952, the Supreme Court ruled that the 1938 rules were too vague to be enforced. So in 1953, Congress clarified this and established new rules that require written notice of inspection from its beginning, uh, written reports of the observation and conclusions, and receipts for any samples taken. You'll see that manifest shortly as I start to talk about um, the forms that FDA uses when it conducts an inspection. FDA personnel have to uh, display their credentials when they uh, give an inspection. And they actually have badges, believe it or not. There are like, they look like police badges that FDA personnel have. Um, and the law grants access to all records uh, processes, controls, facilities that have a bearing upon adulteration or misbranded, misbranding. But um, FDA inspection activities are exempted. FDA is exempted from uh, being able to inspect financial data or sales data, 
except where it regards distribution. Distribution they can see, but sales they can't see. Or pricing analyses. It's not FDA doesn't have the the authority to um, to inspect those things. Uh, you should note that the exemption does not extend uh, to research data on new drugs. So um, if there is research data that's really early, uh, legally it doesn't extend that far. Uh, but you'll hear shortly that um, the distinction of what FDA has in law as a scope of authority to inspect and what actually happens on the ground um, can be different from time to time. So FDA has access to facilities to inspect uh, clinical trials uh, through what's called the Pre-Approval Inspection Program or PAI program. Okay, And that's all referred to in your text. FDA will generally not be persuaded that uh, access is not permitted because testing performed represents um, discovery rather than developmental research. And that's a quote directly out of your book. Um, just to say that um, that line is pretty blurry one. And if an inspector wants to see some of your um, preclinical work, um, then and you're going to claim that that would not have preclinical work that would not be submitted with an NDA, um, then um, you may be right, but it may be better to be friends than to be right. Okay. Um, the specific exemptions of Section 704A2 are that pharmacies that are in compliance with local laws, they don't get inspected by FDA, so not pharmacies, or practitioners uh, of licensed professionals like doctor's offices, they don't get inspected by FDA, they're specifically excluded from FDA's inspection activities, or people who manufacture the drug just for their own uh, teaching or research. So if you got a laboratory somewhere and you're doing research um, and you're making a drug uh, properly in compliance with all other laws, uh, but just using it for your own research and not selling it, then they don't get inspected. And anybody else at the FDA themselves says uh, doesn't get inspected will also be exempted from being inspected. Okay, so a little bit about the forms uh, related to FDA inspection activities. Um, the FDA 483, or the o ever feared 483, is called the List of Inspectional Observations. Now, the law says that this is only for listing uh, adulteration-related observations, but it's actually used for a great many things. Um, and the uh, way that an inspection is carried out, the methods and procedures for that, you need to know. It wasn't part of this course. I may include it um, subsequently, fold it into this course, the Inspections Operation Manual. Now, this is the uh, inspector's manual for how to do an inspection. And it's well worth uh, reading by industry to assure that they understand the procedures and policies that are going to be followed out at the time that an inspection actually goes on. Uh, form uh, FDA 484 is for a receipt for samples. So the FDA is required, if they're going to take samples back and test them for, say, um, something that should be sterile, test it for sterility, something that um, should not have heavy metals in it, test that for heavy metals, well, they have to provide a receipt, and that receipt can't just be scrawled out on a piece of paper. It actually has to be on, on um, uh, Form 484, okay? And um, moving along here, let me see. The next, um, okay, the FDA inspectors uh, can also collect controlled substances. Um, so they can inspect and they can take... Mm, morphine or opiates or whatever the controlled substances are, are but not only do they need to fill out the FDA 484 they've also got a the FDA has to deal with the DEA which controls controlled substances uh, has to fill out all of their um, paperwork as well related to um, that material transfer officially uh, research data is only for NDA submission but like I said this is a this is a gray area. So if there's some data that you as a company think you're not going to be sending it into the FDA, it may be an area to fight about. And let's take just a minute and step back and talk about the general philosophy of this business, of what you let the, uh, the inspectors see. The way that the, the tone of the chapter was very defensive. I mean, she's a lawyer who was writing this, I believe. And... Um, the the care that was given was to 
advise the clients as to what could or could not be seen by the inspector and to draw hard limits based upon the principles of law. Um, and, and that um, is legally absolutely correct. However, um, one should assume an attitude of cooperative helpfulness whenever you're undergoing an inspection. An inspection can occur for one of two reasons. One, because it's routine and they're just supposed to come and they're just, you know, there are a lot of routine inspections that are done. And two, because there's some cause, there's some reason to believe that there might be a problem. There was a consumer complaint or there was some sort of, something went on somewhere in the world that gave someone, somebody got sick, there was some, there was something bad happened. Uh, there's some reason to believe that there may be a problem, and so FDA is coming to inspect. Uh, so it could be either of those two reasons, and you don't really know when or how or why. They just show up. Okay, um, For U.S.-based facilities, they show up on a regular basis, but they don't make an appointment, and they shouldn't. Um, inspections occur unannounced generally. They do um, provide written uh, service of notice, but that's when they arrive, when we're here. It's not, oh, here's your notice, we're gonna come inspect you next Tuesday. It's usually like there's a knock on the door and here we are. Um, and, and, and that's the way that it should be. So um, there are international inspections that occur too. A larger and larger proportion of all pharmaceuticals and reg all FDA regulated products are coming in through imports overseas. Now those inspections are really quite voluntary. Um, but the practical thing is that the FDA can block any products coming in uh, if they don't actually comply and, and do, do it voluntarily, okay? So CGMPs are uh, often constructed in response to the problems that occur, uh, you know, events that have happened and bad public health issues, such as um, low acid foods are regulated, where those CGMPs were devised in response to the low acid foods um, into some botulism outbreaks that had in the 60s and the 70s. There was a lot of botulism outbreaks. Uh, the QSRs of devices were developed in response to problems with those devices. And um, CGMPs for finished pharmaceuticals were modernized most, were modernized most recently in 2007. Um, they apply in an umbrella sense to both human and animal um, products. So in many regards, animal products follow the same kinds of rules as human products. Animal products have to be shown to be safe and effective, just like human products do, and they follow the same current good manufacturing practices uh, as human products. So they should be uh, generally equivalent. Um, they can apply to human and animals. Okay, so the NDAs, the NDA has to cert certify the conformance with CGMP, so when you're sending in your NDA, that's one of the components of it is certification that it was manufactured in uh, under the aegis of, of current good manufacturing practice. And if changes are made, um, you have to notify those, and you may have to notify the the FDA prior to making the change. The uh, and uh, notification 30, you may recall, is is an example of that. There is mention in the reading about the drug master file. This is more of a um, administrative uh, helping tool than uh, people don't f send in drug master files that get approved or disapproved, um, but they are often drawn upon for inspections uh, or they are referenced in NDAs and other uh, regulatory submissions. Um, so it contains all the information about the drug substance, about its manufacture, about its processes, um, but there's not really an approval process for the drug master file per se. Okay, so FDA um, inspectors can can be for a reason or for no reason. They can come in and they can speak with uh, employees. They can examine the kinds of records that we've talked about already. They have this new thing that was mentioned in the book about quality system inspection technique. Uh, it's a new way of trying to formalize and standardize inspections, all the many thousands of inspections that go on. Um, and uh, they mentioned in the book a couple of uh, issues that are um, controversies right now. The one about photography and about taking affidavits. Um, I think 
re trying to return, I didn't completely complete my thought about the philosophy of how should a sponsor have as a philosophy of inspections. Uh, generally speaking, um, it's good to have not only helpfulness, but uh, a transparency, a willingness to have anything inspected, uh, to be able to stand behind what you do in your, in your product. And, and, and so I don't think that issues uh, like photography, for example, you should be willing to have people take photographs wherever possible, wherever they want to take photographs. Now, the book does mention a, a good helpful hint is to uh, bring along your own camera and take your own picture of whatever they're taking a picture of at the same time they're taking a picture of it. So you have something for your own records. Uh, and I think that was uh, uh, good advice. There was advice on hosting inspection. I've been on several inspections, so we can talk about that in the, in the um, didactic part of the class. But um, in, in short, uh, companies tend to be extremely, extremely nervous. I, I, not for FDA, but for USDA. I was involved, engaged in an inspection which led me to have to close a plant and put about 1,300 people out of work at Thanksgiving with regards to a listeria monocytogenes outbreak that was occurring in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, in the hot dog factory. And, um, you know, this, this had very serious implications for the whole community. It was, it was, it was a pretty rough time. Um, so the book mentions um, hosting an inspection that you probably want to have a separate room for the inspectors, that you want to provide an escort, that you want to uh, take, have a scribe, Take, uh, have a checkout each day on our update and reporting of the inspector's um, progress. I think that those are all excellent comments. That you want to have your own command room uh, so that you can have conversations and, and not be overheard about them. Um, I think those are all good. But I think a, a basic attitude of openness, willingness, uh, a shared uh, partnership in learning more about whatever the problem was uh, is a good one to have. Uh, they do mention this question of making sure that nothing you could do could possibly be conceived of as a bribe. Um, that is really important in all dealings with FDA. Uh, once I went to um, Rome, and you should ask me uh, a little bit about that story when we have our interactive uh, um, um, uh, session. I'll tell you a little bit about what's what happened with that and, and, and how and why. Um, Okay, so um, there should be exit discussions at the time that the inspection is closed and a request for uh, outside of FDA authority, um, uh, requests that are outside of FDA's formal legal authority, you should really consider whether or not you could honor them without causing any, any major uh, problems to your company before, before you, you just tell them no and try to draw hard lines for the inspectors. Um, we already discussed the various forms. And we discussed the Investigations Operations Manual, which is extremely important. Okay, I'm going to move on from here into uh, Chapter 14. I found Chapter 14 uh, very clear. Chapter 12, uh, excuse me, 13 was uh, a little um, repetitive and uh, not as clear writing as Chapter 14, but still had great information. That's why I, I think we need you need to know this as KGI graduates who come out with basic fundamentals of, of regulatory affairs. So um, chapter 14 is about enforcement. The FDA is a law enforcement agency, just like your police officers in your, in your local community. They enforce laws. They take actions against products, as we mentioned early on. The product can be the violative agent, uh, companies, individuals, um, and uh, they remove violative products and they punish people who are responsible for the existence of violative products. So the FDA philosophy is to use all appropriate legal means to secure compliance with the FDA's laws and regulations, regulations having the force of law. Um, they do this through their district offices or through the Office of Criminal Investigations. Okay, um, And they can use administrative or judicial procedures. So there's two major um, two major forms of enforcement. Sounds like a good multiple choice question. What are the two major forms of, of enforcement? Uh, administrative or judicial, those are the two. Um, the agency can bring um, an action. Uh, it doesn't need to, uh, uh, to uh, itself, okay? Through administrative action, the agency can, can do it. It doesn't need to go to court or to the Department of Justice. And sometimes the administrative enforcement is the most resource in intensive. Uh, excuse me, 
resource efficient is if they use administrative sources. Um, and sometimes that does involve a hearing as well. Judicial enforcement usually brings in the Department of Justice. Um, and the administrative and judicial responses are not mutually exclusive. The FDA can do both at the very same time. Um, the trend has been towards Congress giving FDA more and more authority to act in administrative ways. So FDA has been vested uh, increasingly with ways that doesn't allow, require it to go out and seek judicial uh, solutions. Um, so there have been, um, the other trend is that there have been uh, fewer seizures because I mentioned to you in an earlier uh, lecture that the FDA is changing from doing so much enforcement into being more of a regulatory agency and preventing problems through the development of increasing numbers of regulations. Now, as you know, this is a hot political topic. The number of regulations and whether regulations are the appropriate mechanism uh, and how they stifle business, some say. Um, but um, it has created an environment in which we have a safe drug pipeline that we can believe in. And that, that means something for business as well, something very positive. Um, so there have been fewer seizures, but there have been more criminal convictions uh, recently. And there has been a, a smaller budget per volume of regulated product, if you will. So that has gotten smaller and smaller, and I guess you could say the government has gotten more productive in that regard. Um, warning letters uh, were big in the 80s and 90s. They have tended to drop off a little bit more. Uh, there is no obligation to warn, as I mentioned just a moment ago, before any judicial action. Um, so warning letters and uh, that 438 form are both public documents. Um, and you don't have to FOIA them. You don't have to get them through the Freedom of Information Act. They're just, boom, right out there on the website for anybody to see. And so um, when a company gets a warning letter, this reverberates through the stock market as well. Okay, you, you, So warning letters are incredibly important. Um, so I'm glad we're, we're having this opportunity to talk about them because um, they can really rock a company and, 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 and drop its stock like a stone. Um, and then, um, see, see, the FDA wants a systematic correction in their warning letters. They don't really want just a correction of particular items. Um, if it were just a thing or two, that might be listed on a 438 form. But if it's a, um, you know, a systematic correction, that may be detailed out in the um, expansive language that a warning letter can take sometimes. And uh, again, there is also adverse publicity. The FDA can always talk to the press. The commissioner can talk to the press. The Office of Public Affairs talks to the press all the time and routes um, conversations with various parts of various centers. Um, and adverse publicity is not good for business. So the FDA has incredible um, uh, ability to affect its changes that it wants to see get done. Uh, whether or not it's using formal court-based systems. Um, and there is no warning and no pre-release, so the company's not going to get a copy of what the press uh, release would be before it's sent out to the press. Recalls. When a product is recalled from the marketplace by a company, those are almost always voluntary actions. People don't know that, but almost always they are completely, completely voluntary. Now, um, the FDA is the one that makes out the guidelines, says you should recall, recall lot X and Z and Q and everything that was made between this date and that date. Um, and it can because the FDA has the distribution information itself through its inspection authorities um, initiate its own sort of recall, but it really doesn't have any statutory authority to say there is a recall of product blah blah. Um, it does have some specific, narrower congressional authorities, and those are gone over in your reading. You should take a look at those. Um, the withdrawal of a product is possible, so they can de-license a product. The NDA is out there. They can pull back the NDA. But that requires a Federal Register notice, administrative hearing, and it is usually just easier for the FDA to talk to the company and say, hey, we want you to pull this drug. And if the FDA tells a company that they want them to pull the drug, even without going through the business of the litigation that's required and the hearings and all of that, um, 
companies generally know that they're on the losing side of any any formal argument so they will go ahead and do it just because the FDA said so um, I'm not saying that I just want you to have a sense of the power which is entrusted within the agency um, the FDA can refuse to review an application if it's determined to be possibly fraudulent so there is a, uh, a list of uh, products that uh, and people that are disbarred from dealing with the FDA hey we think these people are slimy and they are not telling us the truth when they send in an application there's a high probability of fraud and the FDA can do that um, the FDA works with the US Customs to prevent products from entering that might be in violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And we talked about that a little bit earlier, that um, their ability to stop products, particularly products that have a short, health, sh short shelf life, uh, like foods, um, you know, that, that's just pretty much the same as immediately condemning it if, you, if you're holding it up. But you know, only about 2% of all imports are examined. So um, the standard for taking action is very low. All the FDA has to say is it appears to be violative, and boom, that thing is taken immediately out of the market. The problem of this very tiny fraction of all products that are actually looked at um, is, is a big issue now, especially as those numbers of products increase and that percentage continues to drop uh, lower. Um, so... Uh, Entry can be based upon sampling. Entry blockage can be based upon sampling or examination or, quote, otherwise. So there are some very vague um, um, rationale that has to be put forward. And basically, whenever the FDA says this can't come in, it won't be coming in. There are civil and monetary violations. Your book details that in, in quite um, good detail about how much uh, individuals and companies might be expected to have to pay for some of these uh, violations. And there are also criminal uh, fees for them as well. Now, nearly all states have uh, their own version of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So another thing that the FDA can do is if they haven't got the resources to deal with it themselves, they can kick it to the state that this thing is occurring in and say, hey, um, state of California, would you handle um, this particular problem? And the state's attorneys who would be the ones in each state who actually affect this have all networked themselves together and are working together to, to, to do this as well. I already mentioned debarment, that companies can be prevented from doing clinical trials or from submitting to the FDA, and um, that there are some special actions that the FDA has for uh, medical devices. I'm not going to go into that right now too deeply. It's right there in your reading. But um, there are judicial, the, the three forms of judicial enforcement that you need to know about are seizure, injunction, and prosecution. And again, there's a pretty detailed uh, a list in your reading on seizure, injunction, and prosecution. We can talk about them more in um, the interactive class uh, on Monday. Okay, well, with that, we will close out for today. And um, we have one more lecture left on uh, two short chapters. It'll be a fairly short lecture as well, and we will talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.